Man has made multiple visits to the moon in the past and continues to make visits to the moon due to its foreign and ever interesting structure. And China is certainly not the first country to walk on the moon, as other countries have completed this feat before them. However, China is the first country to ever land on the dark part of the moon. Isn't that something? You may be asking yourself, what has China done differently when compared to other countries? Well, let's just say they were the first to explore that part of the moon. The far side of the moon, otherwise known as the dark side, is the part of the moon that faces away from the Earth. This may bring to mind a hemisphere of the moon facing away from the sun, devoid of sunlight and shrouded in darkness. That would be an inaccurate picture, as the terms dark and far do not imply the part of the moon that is devoid of the light emanating from the sun. The moon orbits the planet every 27.33 days in an elliptical path, and eventually passes between the Earth and the sun during the new moon phase. This causes the far side of the moon to be bathed in sunlight for about two weeks, which is quite similar to the other near side of the moon. Both parts are designed to receive an equivalent amount of sunlight and an equivalent amount of darkness. While a certain part is being bathed by the sun, the other side is enveloped in darkness, giving two weeks of darkness and two weeks of sunlight. Why have other countries not explored this part of the moon before? While some countries like the United States and Russia have planned and executed numerous trips to the surface of the moon, manned and unmanned, it has never been proposed to send a spacecraft to the far side of the moon and land it. Complications arise, in that case, due to the phenomenon of tidal locking, the fact that the moon always has only one side facing the Earth. China landed an unmanned craft on the far side of the moon on the 3rd of January 2019, circumventing the problem of tidal locking using a strategically ingenious relay satellite placed in a halo orbit at a point called the Lagrange Point. This enabled the satellite to see the Earth, the craft, and the far side of the moon. This was a huge feat for China, as its strategic navigation gained its first access in history to the unexplored dark part of the moon. When China announced plans in 2016 for a trip to the far side of the moon, speculation and conspiracy theories abound within space science and political circles. While no official reason was given, it was implied that China was merely participating in the Asian space race to carry out normal research and analysis. Japan and India are known as competitors in the Asian space race. A lot of people were skeptical of this though and many assertions were made that China prioritized focus on the mining of resources from the moon, particularly lunar water and helium-3. Why would China be interested in mining helium-3 from the moon? Helium-3 is an extremely rare form of helium, which is very hard to come by on our home planet. It is projected to be extremely useful, and due to its rarity, is very expensive, which brings us to the next question. What makes this form of helium so different? Well, helium-3 is an isotope of helium that has two protons and one neutron, as opposed to the normal form of helium with two protons and two neutrons, which is used in inflating balloons. Although helium-3 is a lot more useful than that, the state of nuclear energy production on Earth has been pretty dicey, with a lot of complications and expenses surrounding it including but not limited to the rate at which radioactive waste from the fission of nuclear materials are produced and their difficulty in being disposed of. Most reactors also use nuclear fission, as opposed to nuclear fusion, which does not have the problem of decay heat and only needs a small number of nuclear materials to be present in the reactor at various instances. In nuclear fission, you shoot neutrons at heavy atoms, thus breaking them apart which free energy could be used to heat water and produce electricity via a dynamo. An interesting fact is that it also frees neutrons, which again breaks other atoms, freeing energy and neutrons, and so on. Uncontrolled, this continuous chain reaction can produce enormous amounts of energy in a very short time. That is basically what happens when a nuclear bomb is detonated, or if a nuclear plant gets out of control. In nuclear fusion, you have to push light atoms together with magnetic fields until they fuse, which also frees energy. It is important to make sure the pressure does not drop if you want to free energy. Another thing is that collapsing of the magnetic fields will cause a malfunction, which can cause the reaction to come to a halt. Nuclear fusion is still far from being a commercially viable option for producing energy at a large scale. However, it is cleaner. 
Countries all over the world are hoping and working on creating a reactor powered by fusion. When that is done, helium-3 is going to be high in demand. This is because in the process of trying to make nuclear reactors powered by fusion, scientists eventually used deuterium and tritium, which are isotopes of hydrogen with considerable abundance on Earth. Helium-3 entered the picture when it was found that adding small amounts of the isotope of helium into the reactor made it more efficient by large. Apart from nuclear fusion, what other uses can the awesome element implement? Helium-3's amazing abilities are not limited to just nuclear fusion. It is used for a whole lot of other things. It is a very important isotope used in neutron detection. How does it do this? It has a high absorption level for neutron beams, and also has utility as a converter gas in forensic instruments. This can be used for the detection of plutonium and can be useful in stopping terrorist attacks. Helium-3 also has use in cryogenics, which implies that it has been proven to be able to reduce the temperatures of substances to very low levels. The element is also very significant in the medical field via its use in medical imaging. Helium-3 highly enhances the chances of doctors being able to view the lungs in various disease conditions, like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cystic fibrosis, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and asthma, which is an occurrence in little kids. Helium-3 is especially important when it comes to MRI. Although regular MRI gives doctors a chance to have a look at body parts like the brain and heart, you cannot use it to see the lungs. This is majorly because the lungs are occupied by air, which has a lower density than fat or water. This will dampen all the signals that allow imaging to occur. To curb this issue, the person concerned can inhale hyperpolarized gas. Hyperpolarized gas is improved with unique procedures that make it easy to read the signals of magnetic resonance gotten from the lungs. Inhaling this gas is completely safe when it is combined with a considerable amount of oxygen. Helium-3 is the kind of gas that can undergo hyperpolarization because it gives off a powerful signal. It is easy for the MRI to detect the gas present in the lungs and airways, allowing us to see what the structure of the bronchopulmonary tree looks like. And it can do this in the spur of the moment. And that means whoever has the biggest stash of the isotope gets a whole lot of money. How valuable is this element? The value and importance of helium-3 can't be stressed enough, as the element is very useful in various aspects. The element is extremely rare on Earth, as mentioned earlier, but is considerably more abundant on the far side of the moon. On Earth, its abundance is somewhere around the range of 0.000137% to 0.0002%. However, on the moon, space scientists have set estimates of the isotopes at numbers exceeding 1 million tons. On lunar soil, known as regolith. The rarity of this element has immensely affected the price of the element. It is set to be worth millions of dollars per 100 kilograms. If we compare the amount of helium-3 on Earth to that on the lunar surface, we might wonder, how did the moon get to have that immense amount? That is a very valid question and can be answered simply. Helium-3 has been deposited on the upper surface of the lunar soil for over billions of years by solar winds. Originally, helium should have been abundant on Earth as implied by the previous statement, but the Earth's magnetic field deflects the solar winds, and as a result, not a lot of it gets into the Earth. We have Earth's magnetic fields to blame for its rarity on Earth. Its rarity intensifies man's quest to mine the element in large amounts to benefit the Earth. Why did China pick the dark side of the moon as a landing site? The moon is said to have high amounts of helium-3, and interestingly, the dark side of the moon has the largest concentration of the element. The unexplored far side is blessed with more of this element because it has significantly higher exposure to solar winds, which increases the deposit of helium on the lunar surface. As earlier stated, the effect of solar wind causes the deposit of helium-3 on the lunar surface so the higher the effect of the solar wind, the higher the deposit of helium-3. Subsequently, it is no wonder if the massive concentrations of helium-3 proved to be a factor in China's landing site decision. Who knows what else they might stumble upon in their exploration, as the moon is a huge satellite with many mysteries that have not been uncovered. As China gave no explicit explanation on its main goal for exploration, we are all eager to learn more.
What will be the results of China's exploration of the dark side of the moon? Will they be able to harvest enough helium-3 to improve life on Earth? We are all itching to find out. Before you leave, make sure to subscribe and click on the notification bell right below to get notified when we post new content. Thanks for watching.